Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my dear friend, Dr. Robert Duggar, who really was at the foundation of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He and I and George Soros had worked together to influence the TARP legislation, and when it passed, albeit not something that we thought was holistic or complete, we talked about things that, uh, how do they say, voids that would need to be filled. And the three of us had a lunch, and, and Rob is very much a founding father of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He served on the board for 10 years until just a few days ago to uh, resume, or I shouldn't say resume, intensify a number of activities that are dear to his heart that he's been uh, building on through INET, and out beyond. He um, is the founder of a group called Ready Nation, about 2,500 people in the business community trying to provide for nutrition, education, and more resources to support the young. He was a hedge fund partner with Paul Tudor Jones at Tudor Investment. Uh, He's been involved in environmental projects in Tanzania, Singita Vemetti, many other environmental projects, including recent lawsuits in Oregon by young people who are taking on our lack of interest in the future. He started his career at the Federal Reserve in the 1970s. He uh, has worked in both the House and Senate Banking Committees. He was at the head of the National Credit Unit Administration for a time. During the SNL bailout, he became a policy director at the American Bankers Association and worked very closely with me and others on the construction of the savings and loan resolution. Rob Duggar is as close as there is on planet Earth to a brother to me. And we have kind of gone in and out most times him first than me following, but I got to the hedge fund industry a little before him. And uh, I, I feel almost a kind of seamless, intertwined exploration that began in about 1984 when I worked with Pete Domenici's staff and continues to this moment and beyond. Rob, thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure, Rob. Glad to be here. Great to be in touch with you. So when we started out, I mentioned sitting with George and talking about some of the shortcomings that were going to become evident in the TARP legislation. You and I had worked very hard with Congressman Jim Moran, Barney Frank, and others and their staff members who were many of our colleagues from time past to, how do they say, inspire that it be interpreted that the TARP legislation would permit uh, the use of equity injection into the uh, into the banks that were troubled or failing, and it, and it did, in, how would I say, that was realized and that tool was used shortly thereafter. But having said all that, you and George and I were not uh, real comfortable with TARP. I mean, obviously the Dodd Frank legislation came on and followed and so forth. But uh, in that lunch, we talked about the. German and Austrian banking crisis of 1931, when the financial system loses its credibility for leadership, stability, farsightedness, there is a void, an ideological void, a void in faith and trust in expertise, administration, governance, or in in this case, in financial economics. And at that lunch, I remember agreeing that I would head off as a, at that time a consultant to meet with economists all over the world. Before I knew there was such a thing as the Queen's question, the question of how do we miss this one? How could things be that far off course was at the forefront of my curiosity. But Rob, I'm mostly interested in how you saw INET what was it mission meant to be right at the outset? 
<laughs> well, I, I remember that lunch too very, very well. And I remember uh, sitting in George's office and we, we were talking about kind of what needed to be done and, you know, who would do what. And I basically made it clear that uh, for me, the commitment I'd made to Ready Nation and building that organization was my top priority and that I would do whatever I could to support you in, in putting together whatever this new thing was going to be, INET or something like that. Um, for me, they, when I look back at the TARP admin, uh, legislation, it is, it is like what INET was about, which is we're going to focus, we're going to move the focus back from the individual to the system. So taking in a, a, a much larger, you know, a, a thing, things through a much broader lens. Um, later in a discussion with the dean of the Georgetown Law School, I came to understand that what I was really uh, sensing was something that actually was deeply a part of me and deeply a part of all of America, which is the final two words of the Constitution's preamble. That those final words are: "We will secure the we adopt the Constitution to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity." Now the framers could have stopped that sentence; they could have just said "secure the blessings of liberty," put a period there, but they didn't. They went on to add ourselves. They could have stopped there, but they didn't. They went on to add and our posterity. So it reads, the purpose of the Constitution is to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. And when we were wrestling with the troubled asset resolution program with the TARP, that's what TARP stood for, that TARP legislation, what we were trying to do was to refocus back from the individual's the bank executives and what their preferences were to the needs of the society, what the best for the country. And for me, that is um, the central challenge of America today and uh, is, is kind of a heart of what I sense was INET's purpose. Well, clearly, Rob, uh, we had just gone through a rather startling time where Financiers were known for frustrating publicly financed projects on the grounds that we couldn't afford it. And then they made a mess of things, snapped their fingers and said, give me $800 billion to clean this up. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're all going down the drain. Yes. And we did. And I think it was the right thing because going down the drain would have been even more prolonged and painful. Mm -hmm. But then the process of money politics and reform essentially defended their getting the money without them paying the price in terms of loss of ownership or criminal prosecution or what have you. Yeah. And I think that contributed a great deal to the demoralization of many people that the government permitted this to happen. It happened. And these people want to use the public treasure, meaning our fiscal capacity, to bail themselves out without paying the price. And that's not a defense of the common good. That is a, what you might call, expropriation of the common good for private purposes. Absolutely, Rob. What we've had both in the, the SNL problem in the late 80s and early 90s and the uh, downturn of uh, the internet era with WorldCom and uh, the other companies that were exploiting their uh, uh, accounting practices. Um, and more, and quite recently with the um, uh, Great Recession in 2008, 2009, um, we had circumstances in which the economics we had Founded as it was with a focus on the individual, so to speak, ourselves, and not on posterity or society generally, mm -hmm. um, that economics um, is an economic that is driven by uh, individual profit uh, objectives, short-termism, uh, and leads to policies that are inequitable and unsustainable. It lead, but not only in finance, uh, across the board, particularly tax policy. We, uh, they, our tax policy 
where we are by virtue of underfunding the Internal Revenue Service, we don't collect four hundred to five hundred billion dollars a year. With a result that that amount of money would have been sufficient to cover the deficits, annual deficits of the Obama years, uh, and uh, it would go a long way to reducing the deficits we now we now have. And so, so and 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 people across the country understand that there are people who are not doing their part. They're not paying their fair share. And this leads to a, a corrosive distrust that pervades everything. Uh, we have a situation in which, in a sense, it's very easy for the affluent and the successful to criticize people running into a store and grabbing a television and they're completely disregard the amount of looting that is being done um, less visibly through the tax system and through uh, many forms of the deregulation we've had over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So the, the, the concern that, that uh, sort of keeps me fired up is a concern that has to do with those final two words of the preamble, ourselves and our posterity. We have a society which is based on the individualism built into the word ourselves, and we give very little uh, regard to the sustainability priorities of the environment, fiscal policy, education levels, health care, housing that have to do with our posterity. And I remember the ethic at that time, uh, 2005, 6, 7, 8, where the, the code expression on Wall Street was IBG, UBG, meaning I'll be gone, you'll be gone. So we got to press it hard now. The upside is ours. And it's heads we win, tails somebody else loses, and we'll be doing something else. Yes, exactly. And that was a very short-term, very reckless, kind of cavalier mm -hmm. approach to public policy in the follow on to that crisis, as you said, when, when I think when we started INET, we were talking about how do we repair, first of all, financial theory, then financial policy, and uh, the structure of the financial industry so that this doesn't happen again. So we had all kinds of contradictions between what was really happening in these idealized notions which always seemed to have done exactly what you said, uh, created a legitimacy for individual short-termism. And uh, I, I think we've had a, an overdose of such false consciousness. And in my view, INET, whether it relates to environment or politics, political economy, the social sustainability of ex ins extreme and growing inequality, uh, money politics. There, there's just so many dimensions that have to be addressed to create something that's what you might call um, channeling us back towards that common good, adequate provision of public goods, and addressing the responsibility of posterity. Tell me, you've, you've done a lot of deep philosophical work from, uh, you know, I've, been, I've sat with you in armchairs and restaurants and so forth, and I've heard biblical stories, founding father stories, passages from Adam Smith. Uh, how do you see the evolution of the responsibility to posterity, the ebbs and flows from the time of Abraham to the present. You know, the, uh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, raised it that way because what it does is it lifts, it lifts our thinking about economics to what we're really all about. Economics is a, a way of talking about how we relate to each other, the, the law is a, a, an articulation of the way we relate to each other, but underneath all of that is 
thousands and thousands and thousands of years of people coming slowly to learn what's right and wrong and slowly deciding that we're going to do things this way. We're not going to do things that way anymore. Um, and over and over again, the way that society ultimately chooses is it chooses posterity. And you mentioned the uh, Abrahamic covenant. Uh, this is the story. You remember Abraham uh, was it, 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 Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, Isaac, yes. um, to obtain God's blessing. And he took Isaac up to the top of the mountain and he was ready to sacrifice him. And God said, no, uh, stop there. You sacrifice that lamb whose horns are caught in the thicket. And God said to Abraham, Follow the word of the Lord, and your descendants will number as the stars. In the Bible and in the Quran, and actually in a number of other uh, theologies, what we come to see is the word of the Lord is actually a way of life, a way of living. These are dietary rules. These are social rules. There are the Ten Commandments, you shall not steal, a covet thy neighbor's wife. All of these rules, which enable society to get from one generation to the next. All of these rules, the word of the Lord is about providing for the next generation, providing for its assured success, its assured well-being. So in a sense, what the covenant is all about is generationalism. And I like to distinguish between the Enlightenment philosophy of the late 1700s and its focus on the individual, that is the Declaration of Independence, which says we're all created equal and endowed with an inalienable right. That's an idea of individual, the focus of the individual. And it was a focus which was dedicated to bringing down the old medieval uh, understanding of human relationships and human rights, which have which had built into it that you are effectively the slave of the person above you in the social hierarchy. No, we're going to get rid of that aristocratic view of rights uh, and wrong, and we're going to adopt an enlightened um, view in which we're all equal. That was what the Declaration of Independence is all about, as an expression of enlightenment individualism. At the same time, the same year, 1776, Adam Smith publishes The Wealth of Nations, and it's an economic expression where the declaration was a political expression. Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, same year, was an economic expression, which in essence said, if everyone pursues their own greed, everyone pursues what they think of as best for themselves, the wealth of the nation will be maximized. What people forget is that Jefferson and the other framers and Adam Smith and all of the uh, sort of enlightenment economic thinkers in uh, England went home at night and on the table in, the, in, the, in their homes was a Bible. And in that Bible, they, you'd open it up in the front pages or the back pages, there'd be lists of generations of people. And each, each person, each, each framer, Jefferson could see his name and he could see all the names that went before him and all and a lot of blank spaces that went, went after him. So Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, all the framers of the Constitution had this sense of themselves as being a part of a long stream of people and they were at the midpoint and there would be a lot of people afterwards. So they had a very strong sense that they were uh, part of a long uh, uh, stream of generations. They also had a sense that they were writing a constitution for generations, that they were writing a constitution, not for now, but a constitution that would project the United States centuries into the future. So they had a strong sense of uh, what I would like to, what I think of as enlightenment generationalism. Um, and we've lost that. The, the Constitution clearly expresses it where it says, secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. The first is the first is ourselves, and that's all about 
Enlightenment individualism, and the second part is about Enlightenment generationalism. And um, the whole problem of quote-unquote new economic theory is to move away from the economics that is based solely on Enlightenment individualism, the Enlightenment, you know, the understanding of of Adam Smith's market uh, theories as um, individually and not generationally focused, which is what we saw in the 2008 downturn, what we saw in the SNL crisis, and what we're seeing now in the response to uh, COVID-19. We have a, a, a reason why the United States has done so much less well in dealing with the disease in comparison to Europe and East Asia is those countries are much more generationally focused than we are. They are much more um, focused on the the well-being of the community, the well-being of posterity than we are. We are, we are blinded and trapped by our, by the by, by the net and the entanglement of our belief that individualism uh, is the way to maximize the wealth of the United States. Sorry to go on. That's good. You know, Rob, my penchant for musical lyrics as I uh, was listening to you, I was uh, recognizing that I believe at the end of Abraham's story, uh, he uh, he did offer to kill his son Isaac, and God spared Isaac. Mm-hmm. Yes, but I remember Bob Dylan singing that song, "Highway 61 Revisited." The first verse: "Oh God said to Abraham, kill me a son." Abe said, "Man, you must be putting me on." God said, "No, Abe, say what?" God say. You can do what you want, Abe, but the next time you see me coming, you better run. Well, Abe said, where do you want this killing done? God said, out on Highway 61. <laughs> so just a little playfulness in there. But uh, but it was the case that by abiding by God's rules, Isaac was spared and it illustrated a pathway where when you were responsible to the collective, we can all be better off, but sometimes painful to subordinate your individual interests for the health of the collective, which includes these future generations. So I think, uh, I think it's a very powerful set of stories. Now, when, when did you see, you know, you, you talked about the Declaration of Independence, but the ebbs and flows... Abraham Lincoln, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. When do you see what you might call the pinnacle of, how do they say, sensitivity to the common good, say, after the Civil War? And and when did it start to deteriorate and why? Uh, It... Clearly, the Civil War represented a, a, a major move back towards uh, uh, a, a thinking of the United States as a, as a single society. And we put mm-hmm. it back together again. Um, we then had the Gilded Age in which, um, of the late 1800s, in which capitalism was absolutely dominant. Uh, there was an effort back to establish labor laws and get rid of child labor. They were the uh, bringing uh, the right to vote to women in uh, 1919. Uh, World War II uh, soldiers coming back had a strong sense of, I think, community. So I think that the posterity was a, was very strong in those late 40s and early 50s. Mm-hmm. Um, the wealth of the United States, however, and the focus of capitalists drove through advertising, through steady political efforts to reestablish 
individualism and the sort of free market fundamentalism um, as a national, sort of our national philosophy. <clears throat> so we move mm-hmm. into the 60s and we begin to see the emergence of a kind of steadily strengthening focus on the individual, free market fundamentalism, the inherent right, correctness of whatever the markets determine, that's the right answer. And then you have, as uh, you know well, the statement of Milton Friedman <clears throat> that um, the um, purpose of business is to maximize profits, that there is no social obligation of business to anything other than simply to maximize profits. That was not the high water mark. That was the trumpet sounding in the night, basically signaling that all those who believe in these free market, uh, unconstrained market activities are free now to go forward. And we saw that uh, steadily gaining strength in the succeeding decades. Um, it reached a pinnacle, I believe, in 2008 with the collapse of uh, basically Lehman Brothers and the entire mortgage uh, finance structure. Um, I think after 2008, the whole country began to become aware that uh, we had gone too far, that uh, the belief in markets, the belief in the rightness of market outcomes had gone too far, that we were faced with a unsustainable economic conditions, unsustainable income distributional conditions, um, and the politics were becoming increasingly difficult and more uh, uh, fragmented. Um, efforts were made to understand that. INET uh, did its, you know, made a, a significant contributions in that area. And I'll just say now that I think the most important contribution of INET is the Young Scholars Initiative. <clears throat> if we to, if we want to understand how that second word in the that that second word posterity is going to be incorporated into economic thinking, it's those young people that will uh, tell us how to do it. In that group of twelve thousand five hundred young people who are members of the Young Scholars Initiative of INET, there are at least five to six or seven Nobel Prize winners. And those people have embedded in them a sense of the unsustainability of, a, of certainly U.S. policies and unsustainability of global uh, environmental uh, and uh, I would say, you know, uh, income distributional um, uh, policies. You know, it's it's interesting to me, Rob, because uh, I think you're in my professional careers or for me, uh, graduate education and so forth occurred at this at this turning point at the end of the 60s. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember uh, Stephen Toulman, one of my favorite philosophers, wrote a book called Cosmopolis, and he talked about. When people are pushing forward vigorously, sometimes people get scared and there's a counter reaction rather than a pushing forward to evolve things. Mm-hmm. And there's a gentleman named Ian McDonald who's uh, deceased, but wrote a book about the music of the Beatles and its cultural and social ramifications and influence, how the music was influenced. And he also said at that juncture, you had two forces which actually fed the turn back to individualism. The first was the attempt of the civil rights movement to use our founding documents and our institutions of governance to enforce a change in the treatment of African-American people. Mm -hmm. Met with, particularly in the South, a resistance to governance. In other words, a resort to a kind of libertarian philosophy because they didn't like to have to follow those rules. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, there was a streak, which we'll call in within the hippies who wanted the government to stay out of how they ran their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, their consumption of different types of substances or their 
relationships with romantic partners or what have you. And so as we moved into the stalemate of the 70s and the rise of the Black Panthers and a polarization uh, and, and the tensions related to the hostages in Iran, that counter-revolution picked up energy by focusing on the individual, which converted some of the hippies and brought the South on board to diminish the power of governance, which had been so important, both from the escape from the depression of the 1930s and in the Second World War and, 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 and shortly, you know, in the years thereafter. Mm-hmm. So it's quite an interesting set of kind of internal forces and dynamics that led, how do I say, back to that Friedman-esque world and, and the crushing of something called the Phillips curve in macroeconomics yeah. by the Chicago School and the adherence to strict monetarism. And all, all of these things, uh, how would I say, blossomed about the time that you and I were emerging professionally. And now the pendulum, at least I would say, I hope is going to swing back a little bit in the other direction. And I think climate and the pandemic are enormous impetuses to both seeing and demanding that we increase vigorously adherence to the pursuit of the common good. Mm -hmm. I agree. Tell me about your work now with Ready Nation and in other dimensions to bring that, how did I say, that uh, respect for posterity back onto center stage. I know you've been involved in some th- lawsuits where young people have sued essentially the state of Michigan for malpractice in its public education. Yeah. And the state of Oregon, it was the location of another suit where young people are suing the government for its malpractice with regard to environmental protection. Yes, I thanks for bringing that up. Um, those two lawsuits, it, 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 it is to say that um, the law is the guardrails that guide the flow of economic activity. Um, You really can't have a new economics until you have built a new set of guardrails. Uh, And we actually aren't going to build um, guardrails out of something that is entirely different. We're going to use the same materials and the same designs that that we've used for a long time. The roads built today are pretty much like roads built for Mm-hmm. Um, and in both those lawsuits, you are looking at the commitment of states. The first one, let's talk about education. The commitment of states to provide um, an adequate education. Nearly every state constitution contains a phrase which promises that the state is going to provide an adequate education. And in the case of the, in the Detroit case, 15 uh, teenagers uh, from absolutely horrifically difficult education circumstances reached age 15 unable to read. And they sued the state of Michigan for failing to meet its constitutional obligation to provide them with an adequate education. The uh, district judge acknowledged that um, the conditions of their education were absolutely horrific. He went back through the terrible conditions that they faced as students and said that what, was, what happened was very definitely wrong. But he could not find in the Constitution a right to an education, an adequate education. So he uh, turned the suit down. The suit was mm-hmm. applied and, and uh, appealed to the... Um, Sixth appeal, uh, appeal um, 
initially, the three judge panel said, yes, the, the kids do have a, there is a, a, a right to an education. It arises out of due process. It arises out of a right to vote. You can't really be a citizen unless you can read in a modern world. Um, then the full district court probably, again, sort of receiving a message from the Supreme Court that they just really don't want to hear this case. Because if 15 kids can sue a state for failing to provide an adequate education, then another group of kids can sue on other bases. For example, there might be a group of kids who sue the federal government for failing to conduct a fiscal policy which leaves them with a manageable amount of debt. They might claim that the misguided fiscal policies of the United States leave the next generation with an absolutely insupportable and unjust debt burden. Um, so the, the, that case has been settled, not satisfactorily, not with a uh, full understanding that truly, if, if there is a right to vote, then there's a kind of implied right to have an education to enable you to, to, to um, vote with, with, with understanding what you're doing. The other case is the Juliana versus the United States. That's a case in which 21 kids uh, sued the United States for failing to um, uh, change policies in a way which would bring climate change under control. Uh, that case, the key idea there is that these children actually have standing to bring this case in the first place, that they have standing to bring a case and hold the government responsible for failing to provide for them what um, another legal concept called the trust doctrine, that, that it would leave to them um, in a, an environment that uh, is, is livable, at least suitable. Uh, that case went up through the court system uh, several times, but ultimately was uh, declared uh, uh, dismissed uh, by the uh, Ninth Circuit. And uh, again, in this instance, the uh, most likely the Supreme Court indicated that it truly did not want to have to hear this case on whether what, what fundamentally is about whether society has obligations to provide uh, for the next generation. Uh, this clearly is a case that depends on the makeup of the Supreme Court. Both cases, in fact, depend on the makeup of the Supreme Court. And they lead us to a pretty clear indication of what uh, where hope is. Just as Abraham Lincoln represents a kind of uh, generationalism, um, a, a, a focus on the whole society, just as he represented a the hopeful direction of the United States, we're at a similar point now. We're across fiscal policy, environmental policy, education policy, health policy. Um, hope lies in the direction of bringing into government a leadership that will drive deep into the DNA of the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, the idea that the word posterity has constitutional power that when you read the Constitution and interpret it in the framework of ourselves and our posterity, you will conclude that there is a, that they claim that we have a constitutional obligation to the next generation is a valid claim. How do we reintroduce what you might call the responsibility to posterity? And you, you take me to maybe we start right here. What happened in Oregon, which instead of ignoring it or rejecting it because it wasn't a president precedent in legislation, it became something vital for consideration and important and sets the stage for what I want to explore with you now, which is the very, very important changes in philosophy, psychology, and practice that are necessary to realize the kind of goals you and Ready Nation are working on 
to whether it's climate, whether it's the what you might call the burden of future debt, how how do we honor those who don't yet vote, those who don't yet have bank books, uh, and create that reverence and that protection of posterity? Rob, that is that that is the absolute core question, and very fortunately, <clears throat> we're we're on the process of doing it. It looks uh, and it always looks messy. Uh, it's always looked messy in history when uh, new rights and new uh, understandings of obligations of people to each other, uh, as those obligations and understandings were coming into place, it's always been a messy process. But the very fact that it's becoming messy is the sign that, ah, we're starting to work. Uh, we're certainly at the beginning of the process. We may be at the end of the beginning and we're into the hard part, but in any case, we're underway. And the central challenge is what we've been talking about for the last 40 minutes or so is those two words at the end of the preamble where, the, where, where it's the the... the majority, a supermajority of the states in 1788 approved the Constitution. A supermajority of the states approved the Constitution with a preamble that says, we secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. The blessings of liberty for ourselves, that's clear enough. People will be able to do business and pursue their own objectives, just like Adam Smith described. The part that's tough is uh, our posterity. How do we assure <clears throat> that what we're doing actually is best for them? For hundreds, for thousands of years, that was actually not a tough question. There was no way in past human experience that human beings could actually wreck the situation for the next generation. In a, in a material way, but we can, now can with the environment, with fiscal policy, with failures to provide the health care and education, family support that people need to raise that next generation well of uh, young people. We have the ability now to do what we, we really couldn't do in the past, which is make the situation for the next generation materially worse than what we received. We violated the most fundamental principle of stewardship. We're not leaving to the next generation as good or better than we received. So when we, the Black Lives Matter is a, an expression of um, a claim to community, a claim to participation in the community. If any lives matter, then black lives matter too. And it's that posterity part. They're pushing themselves into the word ourselves, that's all of us, and they're pushing their kids and their descendants into that word posterity. In other words, everything the United States does has to be right for those kids too. So we're, the, the, the fact that we're having such a terrifically difficult struggle over Racism, classism, um, now, and the uh, you know, objections to uh, economic inequality and opportunity inequality. These are, these are the signs that the society is becoming acutely aware that um, it's having impacts on what it regards as most important. And this is the psychology part that you touched on and why it's so important to remember this. <clears throat> Parents will literally give their lives for their children. And the, when they see their kids getting so much less than they should be getting or could be getting, and their kids are not getting a fair shake, those parents become very edgy. They become very difficult. And so I, I think that what we're seeing is throughout the society, a, an increasing sense that 
my kids are owed as much or better than everyone else gets or as much or better than I got. That's what the importance of the um, literary, literary, literacy lawsuit in Detroit is all about. Does a society owe to its young people an education sufficient to enable them to function effectively in the society? Everyone knows the answer is yes. The law does not recognize it yet. But the fact that we're asking these questions, that's the first step. Now, the next generation of the environmental question, this, the uh, question that's being raised out on the West Coast in Juliana versus the United States, is the question of, does society have an obligation to leave to the next generation a livable environment? And the answer, we all know in our heart, psychologically, we all know the answer is yes. But the law does not recognize that yet. It recognizes it's in some respects, we've got the Environmental Protection Agency, we have the general legal concept of a, of a uh, public trust. Uh, you can't poison the waters. Uh, the Love Canal case is the, the sort of standard there. But does a society in a, in a general way and the answer is yes, it does, in a general way, have an obligation to leave an environment that is as good or better than it received. And the fact that we're now struggling over this is a sign that we're, we're taking the first step. So per personally, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about this. <clears throat> but I, I can tell you, I, I know from lots of scars that uh, it is going to be a tough fight to um, push from recognition, which is what we have now, to action, getting the United States back into um, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, getting established that indeed states uh, have obligations to provide adequate education. So I, 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 it, it, that's, that's the, the struggle part and uh, but the the fact that we are have recognized those two final words and and begun to pay attention to that second one posterity, and then focusing on future generations and our obligations to them, uh, that's occurring and um, that's that's very encouraging, very encouraging to me. In the uh, what I'll call practical trenches. You and I both worked on Capitol Hill. You'd work with the American Bankers Association, and we've each been in the private sector. So you have a lot of different vantage points and visions of process and how results actually are obtained in society. And Rob, what I, what I find interesting about Ready Nation, and you've shared with me your thoughts on this several times, is that... We have a political process that depends upon what you might call the money implications of social policy. And you're bringing people who can provide the services that realize these goals towards posterity, education, health, child nutrition. You're bringing them to the table. And not only are they moral warriors, and why they've chosen their path is certainly uh, is, is deeply related to that. But there can be lucrative and profitable industry in providing these supports. And they're, they're just what you might call different than what's powerful now, particularly as it relates to the fossil fuel industry and the need for profound energy transformation. But I, I, I'd like you to, with our listeners, explore a little bit that vision of Ready Nation, how, how lots of people have a stake in building this system, and you've seen the picture and you've, you've pulled them together to build it together. Yes, Rob, that's, that, uh, what you're referring to is kind of... Um... We may know that it makes a lot of sense, actually, to provide quality prenatal care 
to uh, at-risk moms. But there's some part of our community that says, you know, um, why don't they do it themselves? Why did they get into that situation anyway? Why is it my problem? That's not the approach we take at Ready Nation. We're interested in, they got, they got into that situation, they are on, on uh, they're going to have a child, and what do we want to do about assuring the health of that child when it's born? Because we have, we have morally made commitments to provide for the health of that child through Medicaid. Does it make a difference whether we spend a lot of time uh, on the health of the mother before the child is born? And as it turns out, if you and I invest $100,000 in providing prenatal uh, counseling to at-risk moms, and we do it as a loan and we ask to be paid back uh, with a reasonable, say, 10%, 12% rate of return for a high-risk venture um, in a year, we might be very surprised to learn that not only can they pay us back, but they can pay us back actually very easily. Providing quality prenatal healthcare to at-risk moms-to-be reduces Medicaid expenses of the child enough in the first year to generate a return of 125%. Now, we are making, in Ready Nation, we make moral arguments using economics. Because, first of all, it's more effective in, in, in making a case with state and federal legislators and budget spending uh, executives that determine spending allocations, spending decisions. It makes better sense to argue in terms of uh, economics and cost savings and, and that sort of thing. The moral commitment, moral obligation to future generations is nevertheless there. But the beauty, the miracle is that successful economics, successful economies do work. We are our brother's keeper in these in successful economies. We are mm -hmm. responsible for and we act on that sense of responsibility for the other people in our society. And lo and behold, the society produces more, it's more competitive, it's more efficient, um, it's more successful economically. Uh, another example, for years, there were debates about pre-kindergarten. Should states provide money for pre-kindergarten or should they don't? And they'd, a lot of arguments, well, you're taking the young children out of the, out of the household and we want the young children to be staying at home with their moms, even though we have a situation in which we also want the moms to go out and get jobs. So we argued, uh, there was a tremendous argument for many years about the advantages of providing pre-kindergarten. They would end up with better educated kids and so forth. The arguments that actually won were ones put, by, put forward by INET-affiliated um, Nobel Prize winner Jim Heckman mm -hmm. document that quality pre-kindergarten generates economic returns over decades that are north of 10, 12, 13, 14 percent. So different studies give different numbers, but they basically the, the economic returns from investing uh, in kids, young children, especially at-risk children, are so high, they're, they're higher than stock market performance over decades. So it, we begin to win the argument based on economics. And slowly but surely, step by step, state after state, region after region begins to implement quality pre-kindergarten programs. And, and soon, more and more kids are doing better in third and fourth grade math and reading tests and literacy rates are rising. And a child, uh, 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 you know, the cost of special education are falling because more kids are coming ready to learn. 
all of that stuff is happening. Um, but beneath it all, something else is, is, is actually happening. The economics is working because the ourselves and our posterity is working. When we focus our economic decisions on what's best for posterity, as well as ourselves, but if that po if posterity is right front and center of our thinking, lo and behold, it turns out our decisions are much, much better. We mm -hmm. have quality pre-kindergarten. We have quality childcare. We have good prenatal health care. And lo and behold, the whole society is more efficient. It's more economically robust. It's more stable. It's more, frankly, competitive. That's mm -hmm. what the business people in Ready Nation understand. That's what we've got studies after studies after studies of different situations all across the country, across a wide range of, of uh, 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 human capital investments. And um, it just makes the case that the economics for the country are overwhelmingly better if we're thinking about posterity. When you are among the privileged, yes, but you sense and value humanity, when you see people excluded, you might not be afraid that in this round you're going to be excluded. But when you're a member of a society which engages in negligence or cruel exclusion, your unconscious mind starts to work on the scenarios where maybe the rules change and instead of being the privilege, you become the other. Yes. And you start to know that it's your sense of security and safety is very fragile. Yes. That's what I call living in the haunted house. Now you use the metaphor of the haunted house the greatest philosopher of the last century was John Rawls at Harvard, who used the metaphor of the veil. That is, we know we, we, we make policy or we know what is best for everyone if we make decisions about that behind the veil of not knowing where we or our descendants will be. Mm. Mm. He used, yes. so this is, this is the, the, the metaphor of the veil. It's a... It's yeah, the lottery takes place after you define the system. That's right. So um, <laughs> you need to understand that um, your children and grandchildren will live somewhere, and you don't know where, where in this system they're going to be. And you introduced this idea that when you look around a society, it, it, it lifts some people up and, and lets other people down. Uh, and, and a reality is we don't really don't know um, where our children will be, where our grandchildren will be, our great grandchildren will be. The wealthy in our society attempt to address this uncertainty with trust and estates that are dynastic, that continue for generations, which basically enable those generations of kids to be somewhat immune to the ups and downs of life. Um, if you allow social systems to proceed to the breaking point, none of those elite protections work. They didn't work after the French Revolution. They didn't work mm -hmm. after the Russian Revolution. They didn't work after the Chinese Revolution. And uh, if we are not able to reestablish a sense of, po of posterity, a commitment to posterity in the United States, the economic conditions that follow from where we are now may be so disruptive that all those carefully structured trusts and so forth um, are ripped apart. And mm -hmm. the, the decisions that all of us should have made in the beginning was Let's plan as if we're behind a veil and we don't know where our children will be and we don't know where our grandchildren will be. So let's let's set policies that create a society where we would be happy wherever our kids end up. 
when I listen to you, the song that comes to my mind is one called My Back Pages by Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. And the chorus and the refrain, which I'm sure all of our board members and my staff at INET would agree with me, characterizes your presence. Is I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I honestly think that you and I and Soros and others thought we were kind of like we were we were on to something here. And now I'm very much aware that if I want to know where the future is, I need to go talk to those young scholars. Uh, I'm much younger than that now. I, I need to go visit with those young people and get a sense of how they see the world. Um, because um, I need to know how they imagine making ourselves and our posterity of that priority a reality. So uh, yeah. I, I think we should uh, call it to an end, but in, uh, how do I say, on behalf of our board, Yainet staff, and particularly myself, I know you and I will never disconnect. No. But I'll give you another little jolt to Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. May you stay forever young. Ah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you, Rob. It's a delight to speak with you. And as you keep getting younger, I'm going to bring you back on as we turn the corner and get past the election, and we'll do another session. But thank like you for today. It. I like it. That, that would be great. Thank you so much, Rob. I enjoyed Thanks. it. Thanks. A lot of fun. Me too. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.